Good morning, everyone, and a very warm welcome to you as we gather together here at Emmanuel Church Northwood. And a very special welcome to you if you are visiting or connecting with us online for the very first time. It is great to be able to welcome you this morning. However, we do have another welcome to make this morning, and that is to welcome Christine Britton as our new curate. Christine is a familiar face around Emmanuel. She and her family, Malcolm, Austin, Ted and Annie, have been part of our worshipping community here at Emmanuel for a number of years. But Christine, it is so wonderful to be able to welcome you back as you begin this new role in the life of the church and embark on this new phase of ministry. We're so grateful that God has called you, Malcolm, Austin, Ted and Annie together as a family to continue your ministry here with us. And we pray for, for you all and for you, Christine, in particular, that God would bless you richly as you embark on this ministry. Christine is going to be preaching to us a little bit later on in our service. A couple of other quick notices as we begin our time together. The first is that we're going to be having another encounter gathering. This is going to be taking place at 7.30 this evening via Zoom. Hopefully all of you will have received the links for that either in Friday's email or with the link for this Sunday service. Uh, encounter is a really an opportunity for us to take some time out of the busyness of our lives to stop and to wait on God for a deeper encounter with him. So please do come along if you're free at 7.30 this evening. We'd love to see you there. Also, another notice that we need to make this morning is many of you will have noticed that um, the government has now announced that we can begin planning for reopening of our church services um, from this Sunday. Um, you'll have noticed that we're not actually in church, not actually gathered yet. And that's because for a church of our size and style, there are lots of issues and complexities that we need to consider. Um, some of those include the limiting of numbers, no sung worship, cleaning, and how we might have kids and youth ministries in particular. As you can appreciate, there are lots of things for our lead church leadership to consider. We're going to be having a PCC meeting tomorrow night and would really value your prayers for wisdom for us as a church leadership as we discern the right way forward for us and for Emmanuel and how we can safely reopen our building for public worship. But as we begin our time together, let's pray together. Father God, we are so grateful to you for every good thing that you give to us. Lord, we're so grateful for the gift of Jesus, who has, uh, through his death and his resurrection has opened the way for us to have an encounter with you, Father, to have a relationship with you. And this morning we come knowing that you welcome us. We come to worship you, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, knowing that you love us, knowing that you care for us, knowing that you welcome us into your presence. And so I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you would come into every home where people are watching this video now. Come, Holy Spirit, I pray, and may each one of us meet with you today, Father, for we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to hand over to Ben, Laura, and the rest of our worship team as they lead us in worship now. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for the opportunity today to come together as a church family and to worship you, to spend time in your presence. Father, I pray that you would make us aware of your presence with us by your Holy Spirit. That you would unite us in all the different households we're in, Lord, to worship you in spirit and in truth. We love you. We thank you for all that you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you, I worship you. You are way make miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. You are the way you make miracle work. Promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, 
healing every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, turning lives. You are here, turning lives around. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, mending. You are here. Mending every heart, I worship you, I worship you, you are we make miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are.
Lord, we thank you for your love for us. Father, we just know that there is always room for us in your house. No matter how far from home we might be, no matter where we might have been, no matter where we might have been going, there is always room in your house for us to come home to you. So Lord, if we just say, if we're far off from you, we welcome you back into our hearts. If we've been separate from you, we fall into your embrace. Father, we know that even if we're not 100% there, even if we're still far off, you run out to meet us and open your arms of love to us. thank you that there is always room for us in your house. Amen. Guys, thank you so much for leading us in worship. We're now going to hear a reading from God's word as Stephen comes to read to us as we continue our series looking at the book of Ephesians. And then Christine is going to preach to us. Today's reading is taken from Ephesians chapter 4 verses 17 to 32 and is entitled The Old Life and the New. Now this I affirm and insist on in the Lord. You must no longer live as the Gentiles live, in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God, because of their ignorance and hardness of heart. They have lost all sensitivity and have abandoned themselves to licentiousness, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. That is not the way you learned Christ. For surely you have heard about him and were taught in him, as truth is in Jesus. You were taught to put away your former way of life, your old self, corrupt and deluded by its lusts, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to clothe yourselves with the new self, created according to the likeness of God, in true righteousness and holiness. So then, putting away falsehood, let all of us speak the truth to our neighbours, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not make room for the devil. Thieves must give up stealing, rather than let them labour and work honestly with their own hands, so as to have something to share with the needy. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up, as there is need, and so that words may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with which you were marked with a seal for the day of redemption. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander, together with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. Good morning. My name is Christine and I began this week as curate at Emmanuel Church. And it's my pleasure to be speaking to you this morning. Now, I wonder if you are tired of the word unprecedented yet. I feel like I've heard that word more in the last three months than I have in the last three decades. But I guess it is testament to the times in which we find ourselves. I've heard the pandemic described as a culturally disruptive moment. And for many of us, it's the first culturally disruptive moment that we've experienced. The pandemic has disrupted our lives. It's caused us to relate differently, to work differently, to study differently, to love and help and care differently. But I believe the effects of the pandemic have also caused us to see differently and to think differently. And in this moment of disruption, deep underlying issues of injustice and inequality have risen to the surface. Now, injustice and inequality aren't new issues. They've existed all over the world for millennia. But there's just something different about the present moment we are in with regards to injustice and especially to racism. There's an urgency to engage with 
how we see each other and how we treat each other. And I really believe that this is from God. I think God is calling us to act and to act now. And when we start to acknowledge racism that dwells in our churches and in our own hearts, and we start to talk about it and learn and respond, I believe we are actually partaking in Jesus's commission to go and make disciples of all nations. And we start moving towards God's vision of church, towards the great multitude that no one can count from every tribe and nation and people and language. Now, after following many of the Black Lives Matter um, stories on social media, my son turned around to me the other day and he said, Mum, does the Bible have anything to say about racism? Yeah, yeah, it does, if we're willing to see it. Can I invite you to be willing this morning, to be willing to journey deeper into God's heart for people and for us and for his church? So as we turn to our passage today, let's read Paul's letter to the Ephesians in light of current world events. So what's the first thing we see? Well, in verse 17, Paul says, This I insist on in the Lord, you must no longer live as the Gentiles live. Here Paul is urging us that to live as Christians, as the family of God, as the community of faith, it's to live differently. It's to live distinctly. And so the way we relate to each other, we talk to each other, we behave towards each other, the way we think about each other, that all changes when we accept Jesus into our life. Because we're called by love and we're called to love. God has lavished his grace upon us and we extend this same grace to each other. So when we read this verse in the light of racism, God is imploring us, don't talk about racism, don't deal with racism like those who don't know Jesus. Our weapons aren't shame or ridicule or destruction or hatred. No, our weapons, the ones God has given us, are love, grace, forgiveness, prayer, repentance, lament, reconciliation and peace. In David Anderson's book called Gracism, the Art of Inclusion, he says, racism is not simply a skin problem but a sin problem. And this is what racism really is. It's a sin that dwells in our heart. Friends, let us not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Racism is a sin. Let's repent of it. You've probably heard the quote, holding on to anger is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. Well, sharing God's anger and injustice doesn't mean We don't need to engage in forgiveness and reconciliation. We do, we all do. But until we share God's anger and injustice, we remain impotent to do anything about it. In his book, We Need to Talk About Race, Ben Lindsay puts it like this. Christians should be both angry about racial discrimination and courageous in wanting to change the situation. Well, I stand before you today courageously saying, let's change the situation. Lindsay finishes his book with these words. The world around us is in desperate need of displays of racial unity and a multicoloured picture of hope. How true are these words today? He goes on to say, I believe the church of Jesus Christ has the power to be this witness. Will you join me in being this witness? The next thing I want us to see in Paul's vision of church is found in verses 22 to 24. He says, for us to be church, we need to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, and to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And then Paul goes on to detail the kinds of things we are to put off and put on. So he encourages us to put off futile thinking, darkened understanding, ignorance, hardening of heart, insensitivity, sensuality, impurity, lust, deceitful desires that corrupt, falsehood, stealing, futility or uselessness, unwholesome talk, grieving the spirit, bitterness, rage, temper tantrums, brawling, slander and malice. This is quite a list and quite an undertaking which is why I think right in the middle of the passage, Paul includes a reminder of why we do all this. Verse 25 reads, For, or because, we are members of one another. 
we belong to each other. We are the one new humanity Jesus died to create. God has knit us together and it's him that has made us one. And if we are one, one church, one body and one family, then racism is our problem. Let me tell you a story. When my children were very much younger, we had gone to visit some friends in their home. Now, this couple were newly married, and it can, it, it's fair to say the house wasn't childproof. And this scenario, I know, strikes fear in the heart of many a parent, but off we trotted to their small flat. The conversation was flowing, and, and we were having a really good time, but it was then that I realised I can neither hear nor see my eldest son, and he was probably about three or four at the time. So in a panic, I jumped up to search the flat, and I, happily, I, I found Austin happily rifling through the low kitchen cupboards. I went up to him and I said, hey dude, what are you up to? At that moment, he looked up with a butcher's knife in his hand and a huge grin on his face. I ran across the room to grab hold of the knife just as my friend entered the kitchen. Now what I wanted to say was what kind of idiot stores a knife that size in a low kitchen cupboard? But what I actually said was, ah, look, Austin found your butcher's knife. Then I proceeded to apologise for not keeping a better watch over my son. We all headed uh, back into the living room and now Austin was safely in sight and we carried on the conversation. But the next thing I knew, Austin had helped himself to a book on the bookshelf and in opening this book, he had inadvertently torn out the first page while my friend's face fell as he proceeded to tell me that this was a special edition book that he had searched high and low for, and in fact it was irreplaceable. My heart sank and my overused parental apology began to flow. Now in that instance, I could have said to my friend who was holding his broken book, oh well, it wasn't my fault, I didn't do it. Or I could have said, do you know what, it was really your fault actually because you shouldn't have left your book there. But no. I apologised profusely because I shared my friend's pain at his broken book and I shared the responsibility of my son having broken it. See, I think this is the, the essence of what it means to be a Christian, the essence of God himself, his relationship. Jesus knew we were going to need an awful lot of reminding about this. So the very first word he taught us to pray is our, our Father, our daily bread our sins. The right Reverend Rose Hudson Wilkin said, this is our problem, all of us, and we have to fix it. And when it comes to racism, it's not just about recognising the suffering of others as our own, but acknowledging that our continued silence and inactivity towards changing a system that unfairly advantages the majority at the expense of the minority actually perpetuates the problem for all of us. Paul says, we are members of one another. Let's live like it. So the last thing we're going to look at today from our passage in Ephesians is verse 26 and 27. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not make room for the devil. I like the amplified version of this verse. It says this, be angry at sin, at immorality, at injustice, at ungodly behavior, yet do not sin. So here Paul is telling us to put on anger, to be angry at sin and injustice. And the more I thought about this verse, the more I realised I have a tendency to withdraw from anger. If I'm honest, I'm a bit intimidated by other people's anger. It's uncomfortable and it's scary. And if I'm being really honest, I tend to judge people just for being angry and wishing they weren't angry without even really considering why they're angry. And what this verse did is it made me realise that God calls us to be angry at sin and angry at injustice because he is. And what I'd fail to understand is that anger is a godly response. And Paul's call to be angry made me realise that I have not shared God's anger at injustice. And when we remain silent about injustice, we end up perpetuating it because our silence feels bitterness and our silence encourages resentment. Our silence reinforces hostility and our silence, it makes room for the devil. How do we do this? How do we share God's anger at injustice? 
Firstly, I think we need to separate godly anger from human anger. James 1.20 says, human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Around the world, we're witnessing human anger in so many aspects of the fight against racism. There's riots, there's slander, there's shaming, and there's silencing. And anger is being met with anger. But this doesn't represent God's anger and injustice. That's just human anger and injustice. So how do we share God's anger and injustice? Well, I believe there's a distinction between God's anger at things like injustice and his anger towards people. When it comes to God's anger at injustice, the Bible says, I know that the Lord secures justice for the poor and upholds the cause of the needy. That's Psalm 140 verse 12. Psalm 146 verse 7 says, He upholds the cause of the oppressed. And Psalm 7 11 says, God is a righteous judge, a God who displays his wrath every day. For the oppressed, the poor, and for those suffering injustice, these are words of hope. Because God shares your anger and he shares your pain. He will not forget your cause or lay it down. He upholds it. The injustice and the oppression that you suffer are remembered and hated by God. He does not fail to see every slander, every insult, every microaggression. He upholds your cause. So even when you are weary of carrying it and burdened by explaining it to those who do not understand, God upholds your cause and he carries you. Because God maintains anger towards injustice, oppression and racism. But when it comes to anger towards people, the Bible expresses God's anger as slow and brief and restrained. God's anger towards people is firstly slow. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. We find this verse again and again throughout scripture and it tells us that God's anger is not reactive or explosive or volatile. God's not quick-tempered. Secondly, God's anger towards people is brief for his anger lasts only a moment but his favour lasts a lifetime, it says in Psalm 30 verse 5. God's anger is brief. He is merciful, deeply, deeply merciful. And thirdly, God's anger towards people is restrained. Psalm 78, 38 says, Yet he was merciful, he forgave their iniquities and did not destroy them. Time after time he restrained his anger and did not stir up his full wrath. You see, God holds himself back from expressing his full anger. So whilst God maintains anger at sin and injustice, his Anger towards people is slow and brief and restrained. And I believe this is why Paul follows straight after the call to be angry with, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Because staying angry at others actually harms us. Christine, thank you so much for sharing that word with us. I'm aware that, uh, that this may be a painful subject for many of us and that you may value as a result of things that this sermon may have raised in you, the opportunity for you to pray and to chat with a member of our clergy team or pastoral team. And if that's the case, I would encourage you to make contact with us. Um, the details of how you can do that will be on the screen now. But also we recognize that this is an issue, a wider issue in society, church, and perhaps even in our own personal lives as well. So why don't we just take a moment to be still now and wherever we are and whatever we're feeling, bring those thoughts and feelings to God in this moment and to allow him to come and speak to us. And then after we've had a moment in silence, then I'll pray for us. Father God, we know that you are grieved by injustice in our society. Father, we know that where there is sin in our hearts, Lord, you call us to repentance. You call us because it's a gift and it's your kindness that leads us to repentance because your heart for us is wholeness and healing. And we believe that that is true also for your world as well, that we as your people are called to make a difference in this world, that we're called to be agents of transformation, bringing wholeness and healing into our societies, into our neighbourhoods, transformation into individual lives. So Lord Jesus, I pray and ask that you would come by your spirit, that you would move by your spirit, that in this time where we recognise that you're at work in your world, Lord, would you start with us? 
Would you bring your transformation into our lives so that we may truly be agents of transformation in the world around us? Holy Spirit, come, I pray, and bring us challenge where we need it, bring us comfort where we need it, and give us and equip us as a whole church with all that we need to be your agents, to bring about your kingdom and your purposes in our community and in all of the communities that we live, as well as this great city of London. Father, bless us, we pray. We ask it in your name. Amen. And I'm going to hand over to Giles now, who's going to continue to lead us in prayer. Let us pray the church's prayer for today. God, the protector of all who trust in you, without whom nothing is strong, nothing is holy. Increase and multiply upon us your mercy, that with you as our ruler and guide, we may so pass through things temporal that we lose not our hold on things eternal. Grant this, Heavenly Father, for our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. Heavenly Father, may we indeed depend upon your protection and mercy as we live through these times, not relying on our own strength, but trusting you for our future. We ask that you will give your assurance to those who are fearful, whether for their health, for their jobs, or for family members. Let us pray silently now for those who need God's healing in body, mind, or spirit. Loving Lord Jesus, may we take you as our ruler and guide. We pray for the leaders of our nation and local communities in their decision-making, asking that you will give them your wisdom to know what is best and the courage to act upon that. We pray for ourselves that we may live each day in obedience to your word and follow the Spirit's leading. Please help each of us to look beyond our current situation and to live with the confidence that we will share eternity with you. Let's just pause and reflect what that may mean for us individually in practice. May we truly believe that Jesus is alive and reigns in this world. We ask that you will inspire your church to speak out at this time of doubt and uncertainty and to proclaim the good news of Jesus to all the nations with boldness. We pray for Emmanuel's mission partners and their witness in their different locations around the world. We pray for the consistency of our own witness, to our neighbours, to our friends and to our work colleagues. In particular, we ask that your spirit would work in the hearts of all who have been attending the Alpha and Youth Alpha courses. Lastly, we seek the unity that the spirit brings in our Church of England, in our Diocese of London and here at Emmanuel. So let us close by praying the grace together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and always. Amen. Giles, thank you so much for leading us in prayer. I'm going to hand over to Liz now, who's going to lead us in our final song of worship. Oh 
We've come to the end of our service this morning, but we haven't come to the end of our opportunities to connect with each other today. Um, we've got our normal Zoom coffee morning. This is taking place at 11.15, and the links are in the usual emails. Look forward to being able to welcome you and connecting with you there. But now, as we come to the end of our time together, a final prayer of blessing for us and for all of those whom we know and love and hold in our hearts today. So may the love of the Lord Jesus draw you to himself. May the power of the Lord Jesus strengthen you in his service. And may the joy of the Lord Jesus fill your hearts today. And so may the blessing of God Almighty, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be upon you and remain with you this day and always. Amen. Amen. It's been wonderful to spend this time together with you today. Take care. God bless. And I hope you have a wonderful week.